Alright, so we're going to get started on Move to Global War, Japanese expansion. Um, and we're going to be starting with the unit causes of, of expansion from 1868 to 1930 with the subunit of, you know, what was the impact of Japanese nationalism and militarism on foreign policy. We're not going to cover everything from this subunit uh, on, in this video, but we will be, you will be seeing that within the next few lecture videos um, and we'll cover everything eventually, including Italy and Germany down along the line. So in order to understand and, and think about or understand why this expansion is happening, what triggered it, we have to understand Japan before 1868. So quick background summary. In theory, Japan was ruled by an emperor, but the reality was that Japan was actually ruled by military government known as the shogunate. Um, this, this federal, this, this, sorry, this system was a feudal system where the military, where a military hierarchy existed and the land was given to high ranking individuals in exchange for military service. Uh, powerful people had, who owned land had military to protect them. The most powerful clan, the group at this time of Japan was the Tokugawa clan. They were dominant um, among all the military leaders in Japan. So it's multiple military leaders with their clans and they all have their symbols and everything and um, the region that they control and the Tokugawa was the most powerful. I think they were in power for about, mm, I want to say 300 years, but I might be wrong. Um, up until this point, there is a documentary on Netflix or a docu series live action on samurai, and it explains a system that was built in Japan, and it mentions a lot of the people that are mentioned here. Um, next slide. <clears throat> so, just further breaking down Japan's government, um, the emperor was again the head of state, but had no political power. The shogun were the ones who held real power, and they were the ones um, that controlled the politics, policies, all those things in Japan. And the Takagawa being the ones with the most power, so things usually went their way. Um, below them were the daimyo; they were the overlords who who were given land in exchange for loyalty. And loyalty is really important because again, if you have those numbers on your side. There's not going to be that many people who challenge you because they know how powerful um, and the numbers are on your side. Or if they do challenge you, there's a chance that they might not succeed because, again, more people on your side means you're stronger, you have more samurai, right? More, more men in your own military. Um, below that um, was the, the, the peasants, right, who worked the land and in exchange received uh, protection by the samurai from pirates or other bad samurai, rogue samurai. Um, and then below that was the merchant class, which might be a little surprising. It's like, oh, the merchant class, like even the rich people. Yes, because these merchants were pretty wealthy. They were still below. Uh, reason why is because Japan's Confucianism philosophy valued productivity and merchants did not really necessarily embody that. Next slide. So this, this system was very strict and it had existed for a long time. Uh, and the Takagawa were in power for a really long time. So why is this system breaking down? Well, the reason one is why is because the population is growing, and so therefore there is a demand for food and goods. The merchant class at this time is the one that can fulfill those needs, and so their importance starts to grow in Japanese society. And since they already have the wealth, now that they gain the importance, their wealth can do more, right? It can basically they can expand their wealth and influence more things. Additionally, samurai were going into debt because they were having their own issues, they were, you know, attending imperial court and whatnot, and because there's all of this, you know, the system is breaking down, and when, when there's a breakdown of a system, there's a vacuum that gets created because people are trying to fill in that hole that's about to basically collapse. And so there are, there are clans who are looking at the situation and saying, we can challenge the Takagawa. And so that's what they're trying to do at this point. And so the Sasuma and the Shoshu, I'm so sorry if I'm butchering, I know I am butchering it, sorry. They start to rise and they start to challenge the Takagawa and their plan is to basically take over. So again, you can see where the cracks are, are coming in at this point. Um, and then to top it all off, here comes the Western powers, the United States, right? And so we have to look at the impact that the US had in the change of a system and what caused Japan to eventually change the system and then want to expand. So there's this guy named Commodore Perry, as you saw in the previous slide, um, that was his face. Um, basically, 
before 1868, Japan was an isolated and closed off country. Commodore Perry sailed the U.S. Navy into modern day Tokyo and he brought, he went to the emperor, Jap Japan's emperor, gave him a letter and said, this is from the United States. Um, we want to trade with you. Basically, open up your borders because you're isolated. Isolated means they're not letting anybody in. Okay, very strict. Just think of very strict immigration laws at this point. They just want people to leave them alone. They're minding their business type of stuff, right? The United States said, uh, you guys got stuff that we want and we want you to open up trade. Um, but think about the fact that Perry went to the emperor. Think about why that's a big mistake. He's not going to, the, the negotiations were, were unsuccessful, right? Negotiations were unsuccessful. Why? Because he went to the emperor. Remember, the emperor holds no power at this point in time. So really, he's just kind of, it's like you going up to just a random person um, and at, demanding for, for them to give you stuff, right? And they hold no power over what it is that you're asking for, right? That's basically what it was. Um, who sh he should have gone to was the, you know, the Takagawa clan, right? Somebody like that. Um, but the U.S. did not have really an understanding of Japan's system at this time. And so they, they thought that because, again, common sense would say, yeah, the emperor is the one that holds power. But that's not what's happening, right? Also, because uh, very few Japanese knew English, there was a lot of mistranslation. Um, and so the that's part of the reason why they went to the emperor as well, not the shogun. Uh, next slide. Um, so he gets rejected, Perry gets rejected, and but then returns to Japan in 1854. This time he brings his ships with heavy armor, firepower, and he shot, shoots out his cannons and he's basically showing off the U.S. firepower to Japan, um, not so much to hurt them in that moment, but to show it off and say, look at the guns that we got, you know, resisting us and our demands is not really a smart move because we can beat you like that. OK, uh, Japan realizes this and they're like, all right, I guess we have to. So in 1858, they signed a treaty um, with the U.S., giving the U.S. further trading and residency rights. Um, and basically, uh, the, the member who, one of the, the people who signed this treaty or was responsible for the signing of this treaty got assassinated by a samurai who thought that they were making Japan submissive to the United States. So it was a really big deal. It's, it's, it's like a, a moment of humiliation, a moment of, de of defeat. Um, and now these borders are open because they were forced to, not because it was their own decision. A different country came in and bullied them right and now japan is concerned with well, how are we going to handle this in the future what's going to happen with that next slide so the solution to this is we got to modernize because we're not going to become a colony we want to be a western or we want to be equal to a western power we want to be a big dog calling the shots we want to be the bullies and so that's what's happening in the 60s 1860s um, and they wanted to make sure that they became a power um, but they would have to industrialize and modernize. And so how do you modernize a country in Japan? Number one, you get rid of the samurai. This, you know, they're cool. They got really sharp swords that could, you know, uh, the katanas that can do a lot of damage and kill you, right? But it's not really a match against a military that has guns and modern armor that can protect you from, you know, bullets and things like that, right? Um, so they start to replace their military with that. Of course, nobody's going to be happy 100% of the time, right? So, you know, people aren't going to be happy 100% of the time. So there's going to be a split. There are those in Japan who are like, this is good. We need this. And then there's those in Japan who are like, what are you doing? Why are you doing this, right? Um, so that's happening. There is a lot of conflict. Um, at the time that this is happening, the emperor dies in 1866, and a new emperor comes in, steps in, Meiji, and he's 15 years old. And so remember those other two clans, the, the Satsuma and the Chochu clans? Basically, they were rising in power and they wanted to challenge the Takagawa. They see this as their opportunity. Hey, we take this 15-year-old emperor under our wing. He's very impressionable, easy to manipulate because he's 15 and we're adults. Um, and we challenge the Takagawa and, you know, with the modern, modern army. And so that's what they did. They bring the modern army, 
they challenged the Takagawa. The modern army with bullets is more powerful. So the Civil War goes from 1868 to 69, and they're fighting. And it ends with the defeat of the samurai. And this new system is going to be set in place from here on out. Um, and the emperor's power was restored once again. That's extremely important. Restored once again. This is they're they're gonna advertise this as we're going back to our roots before the system of the clans was in place. And we're gonna go back to the roots of when the emperor had power in Japan a couple hundred years ago. Um, and you'll see that in the next lecture. But that's it for now. Um, thank you.